start. Uh, my name is Jiri Schneider, and uh, I'm currently senior fellow, at, senior fellow at Prague Security Studies Institute, and I'm privileged to uh, to chair uh, the panel uh, uh, with uh, excellent uh, speakers to address the issue, which is, uh, uh, I would say. Uh, less focused than a very concrete issue of uh, what happened with uh, the NPT review conference. Uh, our task will be to uh, highlight some trends, uh, recent trends and probably future trends in an uh, area which is uh, uh, called technically as a new uh, uh, emerging uh, nuclear powers, which has to do with uh, the question of uh, not just peaceful uh, uh, use of nuke, but uh, the potential uh, military use, weaponization of nuclear uh, power in some parts of the world. Uh, let me, uh, before I introduce the panel, uh, let me say uh, uh, on a personal note that I'm glad that uh, this conference, this gathering called Prague Agenda Conference uh, goes on uh, because I was uh, at the inception of the idea to have a review of uh, on occasion to uh, remind ourselves about a, uh, uh, the speech of President Obama a few hundred meters from here. Uh, every year and to, uh, to do some stock taking uh, in all related areas, not just disarmament, uh, but arms control, uh, peaceful use uh, of uh, nuclear energy and so on and so forth. Uh, so I'm very happy that I, I can be here and I can see that uh, the agenda of the conference is growing <laughs> and it's uh, many uh, accompanying components uh, of the conference. It's not just the political uh, conference, as it is called, but there is an academic element, there is a movie, uh, there is a parliamentarians uh, gathering uh, uh, in the town, and uh, I'm more than happy to see that. Now, uh, uh, we have in panel, uh, maybe you have noticed that uh, there have been ch some changes. Uh, we have Mark Fitzpatrick from uh, IISS from London. Uh, uh, he's been a notorious uh, um, participant of these events. I'm happy he's back uh, to Prague. Uh, he will kick off the debate. Uh, the second will be uh, uh, Jacek Bilisa, uh, who uh, was uh, uh, supposed to uh, speak in the first panel according to original program, but he was kind enough to accept uh, uh, the change and he will speak on the uh, second panel. Uh, he is known, I think, uh, to most of the people in the room. Uh, he's a, a special envoy uh, for non-proliferation and disarmament uh, in the European Union External Action Service in Brussels. And last but not, not least, uh, uh, also Brussels-based, uh, Wolfgang Rudischhauser, uh, who is the director of NATO's WMD Non-Proliferation uh, Center. So we'll have a view from the think tank, who is a part of uh, the uh, Non-Proliferation Consortium, uh, uh, very important, uh, uh, I, S, uh, and a top expert from there. And uh, you will hear a perspective uh, uh, from two Brussels, uh, the EU Brussels and the NATO Brussels. Uh, with no further ado, I will give the floor to, to Mark uh, to start the debate. Thanks very much. I deeply appreciate the, uh, the invitation and the opportunity. It's been clear over the last day and a half that there's general agreement. There are nine too many nuclear armed states, nine too many at least though there are not more than single digits. And over the past dozen years, some states that aspired to join the club have either been denied or dissuaded. Those who were denied include Iraq and Syria, 
the dissuaded category include Libya and maybe Myanmar. The, but the most worrisome development, I think, was in 2006, when the ninth member joined. North Korea is the only state to have tested nuclear weapons this century. It's the only state to have withdrawn from the NPT. I think it's the only state which joined the NPT with the clear intention of violating it. It's an outlier in every respect. Now, we cannot be certain that North Korea actually has nuclear weapons. It has tested nuclear devices. This does not mean necessarily that it has nuclear warheads. It has tested missiles going up, but it hasn't necessarily tested them coming down, the re-entry. It hasn't calibrated the re-entry. But still, after having worked on the issue, North Korea, having worked on nuclear weapons development for 25 years, I assess that it probably can put a nuclear weapon on a Nodong missile that can hit Vladivostok and Beijing, well, probably not aimed at those directions, it can hit Japan, it can hit South Korea with nuclear armed uh, uh, missiles. And that's a, a, a danger that concentrates the mind. North Korea is not willing to trade its nuclear program for any commercial or diplomatic benefit. It put nuclear weapons in its constitution. It insists that it will maintain them forever, which leads me to conclude that the best solution is for there not to be a North Korea forever. Eventually, the Korean Peninsula will reunify, and the unified Korean Peninsula should be nuclear weapons free. This is what the leadership in Seoul has said repeatedly. We shouldn't recognize North Korea as nuclear armed in any de jure sense. Uh, recognize, recognizing North Korea in a de jure sense would empower North Korea in ways that they do not deserve. But we need to recognize facts that they've been working on this program, and steps need to be taken to try to reduce the dangers. At least, if North Korea will not give up nuclear weapons, maybe it will agree to some intermediate steps of a moratorium on testing. So there should be engagement to try to halt its advances. We have seen the power of diplomatic engagement in another setting earlier this year, when Iran agreed to accept deep cuts to its nuclear program and intrusive verification in exchange for, let's say, legitimacy of its uranium uh, enrichment program. The Iran nuclear accord, I think, was beneficial in many ways. First of all, first of, all of course, because it stopped the program that other my, otherwise might have developed to nuclear weapons. So it prevented uh, nuclear nuclear weapons at least for 15 years, and it prevented a war to stop this development. It showed that a combination of engagement and sanctions work to create the dynamics that allowed Iran to accept limits, but it also was important that there were presidents in both Iran and the United States that, who were pragmatic enough to seize the opportunity. The Iran Accord showed how the major powers could work together. They maintained consensus, which was vital to achieving the agreement. Russia and the West worked together very cooperatively to get this deal. And it's important to realize that in so many other areas of nuclear issues, Russia has departed from the former uh, working together. I think we have to build upon this consensus in the Iran deal. The Iran deal also showed the importance of verification. It made the IAEA additional protocol uh, more universal. There are, you know, it's not a perfect deal. Uh, 
after 15 years, when the limits are lifted, Iran would be able to have as large of an enrichment program as it wants. Uh, it would be able to be much closer to um, developing nuclear weapons if it chose to do so. And that's it. That's a worry. <laughs> One answer to this worry is that we'll be lucky if the deal lasts 15 years. I think there are many ways the deal could unravel. But if it does last 15 years, it will demonstrate 15 years of compliance, 15 years of building trust, 15 years of verification working. So we, after 15 years, can have a greater uh, sense of confidence that it will continue to work. One looming issue is whether the Iran Accord could prompt others in the Middle East to seek the same capabilities. Saudi Arabia has indicated that it too would like to have an, a uranium enrichment program that now Iran has uh, been allowed to have. And the purpose would be as a nuclear weapons uh, hedging strategy for Saudi Arabia. Even if it doesn't move toward nuclear weapons, it wants to have this capability. This is, this is dangerous. And I don't think it's going to happen because I don't think anybody will help Saudi Arabia or any other country in the region acquire this capability. The nuclear suppliers group rules uh, prohibit it. Pakistan, which is often suspected to be the country where Saudi Arabia might get nuclear weapons technology, has said absolutely not. And if you doubt that, look at how Pakistan responded when Saudi Arabia asked Pakistan to contribute to the intervention in Yemen. Pakistan said, no, we're not going to. We're not going to send warplanes. We're not going to send troops. We don't bow to Saudi Arabia's requests. And I think Pakistan will respond the same way if Saudi Arabia asks for nuclear weapons uh, technology. That leaves North Korea as one potential supplier, and I am worried about that. In thinking about the possibility of a proliferation cascade in the Middle East, uh, a nuclear dominoes uh, effect in the Middle East, it's useful to look at what has happened in Northeast Asia. Many of us used to think that if North Korea tested a nuclear weapon, it would be a game changer. It would prompt South Korea to want nuclear weapons itself. It would prompt Japan to re-examine its uh, non-nuclear stance. It didn't. South Korea and Japan remain non-nuclear. So does Taiwan. Even though all three of them have the means and the motive Japan in particular has both enrichment and plutonium reprocessing. And because they have it, the South Koreans want a form of reprocessing called pyroprocessing. But all of these states did not go nuclear for, I think, three important reasons. One is they value the NPT. They value nonproliferation. The second is they realize the downsides. Going nuclear has many economic and strategic downsides. It means that they wouldn't be able to get cooperation for their civil nuclear programs. It means they would be provocative to both potential antagonists and to neighbors provoking an arms race. It would increase their vulnerability. A third reason why these states in Northeast Asia did not go nuclear was because of their alliance with the United States, an alliance that includes a nuclear component and which gave them a reassurance that they would be defended and that they did not need uh, to seek nuclear weapons of their own. Actually, both South Korea and Taiwan did seek nuclear weapons once upon a time in the 1970s when both were led by autocratic governments. Uh, but both times, the United States stopped the effort. The alliance worked. The past motivations for these states remain valid today. South Korea was worried about North Korea. It has even greater concern today because of North Korea's nuclear weapons. Taiwan was worried about mainland China, which today is far more powerful than it was then. Japan 
is concerned about China's nuclear capabilities and its growing conventional capabilities. But all three can continue to rely upon the United States, and they've continued to make the choice repeatedly not to go nuclear. There have been some suggestions that the United States should share its nuclear umbrella with other countries, share the nuclear umbrella with Saudi Arabia so that the Saudis wouldn't need or want any uh, nuclear deterrence of their own. I think this would be highly inadvisable. We need to give less salience to nuclear weapons, rely on nuclear weapons less, not more. And, and, this, and Saudi Arabia, no other state, needs to have a nuclear umbrella to defend itself. Conventional military capabilities are effective for any purpose that nuclear weapons could serve, and they're much more credible. Because of the taboo against using nuclear weapons, it's not a credible uh, deterrence, certainly not um, in a Middle East uh, uh, scenario. Now, nuclear weapons do have a use in deterring other nuclear weapons. That was part of, uh, as Adam Scheinman pointed out in the Nuclear Posture Review. But in the Middle East, I'm pretty sure that Iran will not develop nuclear weapons, so there won't be a need to have nuclear weapons to deter an Iran armed, uh, nuclear armed Iran. Uh, Obama has made clear Iran will not be allowed to have nuclear weapons, and Iran has made clear that they're not going to seek nuclear weapons. Now, North Korea was allowed, despite all of the intentions not to allow it to get nuclear weapons. But there's a huge difference between the Northeast Asia Korean situation and the Iranian situation. In the Korean situation, America's partners did not want America to use military option to destroy North Korea's nuclear program. South Korea did not want um, another Korean war that would devastate the capital. Seoul lies so close to the North Korean border that it would be engulfed in a sea of fire if the Korean War broke out again. So the United States uh, took the military option off the table and eventually North Korea got uh, nuclear weapons. In the Middle East, the case is the opposite. For better or worse, America's allies and partners in the Middle East want the United States to use a military option. I suppose most people in this room might not want that themselves, but it's, it's why I think deterrence will work in the Middle East to deter Iran from going down a nuclear uh, weapons uh, path in addition to the diplomatic engagement. The situation is very different. Let me conclude then on this um, summary note. A judicious combination of various tools of counterproliferation, of nonproliferation, of deterrence, of disincentives and engagement, I think can continue to work to keep the number of nuclear armed states to single digits at least for the next 15 years. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for uh, uh, what was unexpectedly uh, uh, optimistic. <laughs> Uh, taking uh, the elements of the situation uh, uh, in, around the world into account. Uh, the next speaker will be uh, Jacek Bilica, uh, and uh, he promised also to address uh, uh, more uh, in detail uh, the question of uh, Iranian deal. So, Jacek, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Iji, and I must confess I very much like the optimistic conclusion of uh, Mark's uh, analysis. But first of all, let me thank the organizers uh, of this conference for having me as, uh, as a panelist for a second year in a row. I very much agree with Deputy Foreign Minister Kulhanek in his opening remarks that this conference has become an important feature in the annual uh, disarmament and non-proliferation calendar of events. It is obviously because of the importance of President Obama's speech 
in 2009 here in Prague, which is already enshrined in diplomatic history along with such uh, moments as the Reykjavik summit between Presidents Gorbachev and Reagan. I would like to address two issues briefly. One is the um, more generic issue of uh, emerging nuclear powers, and secondly, indeed, the uh, deal with Iran. Uh, on emerging nuclear powers, I think they can be understood in two different ways, and they have to be understood in two different ways. First is the states aspiring to become nuclear weapon states. And here I must say that the European Union has a very, very clear principled position. I mean, our principled position is to support the NPT, which lists by name five recognized nuclear weapon states. And we uh, stand on the principled position that the NPT should be universalized and other countries should join it as non-nuclear weapon states as has happened in the past in the cases like Ukraine, for example, the countries, or South Africa, countries have renounced nuclear weapons in the past and have joined the NPT as non-nuclear weapon states. So from the point of view of the European Union, there is uh, no uh, prospects uh, in any foreseeable future for recognizing, for example, DPRK as a nuclear weapon state in spite of all the claims, provocations, which, uh, which are you know, ongoing uh, on, on and off. But on the other hand, uh, we can think about emerging nuclear states in the sense that more countries want to benefit from the peaceful applications of nuclear energy. And this is a legitimate sovereign decision of any country which uh, can be supported also with some technical expertise and, and sometimes financially by the European Union because it's an inalienable right of any uh, state party to the NPT to develop research, production and use of nuclear energy for peaceful purposes without any discrimination and in conformity with the treaty. Obviously this should be done, and this is the important point, in under the best safety, security, and non-proliferation uh, measures. Uh, the security of uh, nuclear facilities uh, is uh, a national responsibility, but still there is a role for international community. There is an important role for the International Atomic Energy Agency. We have a nuclear security summit process, which has been again initiated here in Prague, thanks to President Obama's speech in 2009. And uh, this is very much supported by the European Union, both politically, with technical expertise, and also financially. Um, the EU is one of the major, if not the major, contributor to the IAEA Nuclear Security Fund. Nuclear safety, is an objective, has an objective to prevent nuclear and radiological accidents. Uh, very important following the Fukushima nuclear disaster, which has, uh, I must say, which has forced a number of countries to take a pause or rethink something which was used to be called the nuclear renaissance. But uh, again, there are ways to uh, mitigate also the effects of accidents uh, avoiding, for example, off-site contamination if accidents occur. Uh, a, a third element which needs to be uh, sort of highlighted in this respect is the assurance of supply of uh, nuclear fuel. And here the EU supports uh, the initiative and the actions of the IAEA by cre of, of the creation of um, a bank of low enriched uranium in Kazakhstan where we provided also tens of millions of euros for the purchase and, and the construction of, of this facility. Uh, so this is in, in terms of more generic uh, points. Uh, specifically on, on Iran, the case was already uh, introduced by uh, Mark uh, in very positive uh, tone. And indeed, uh, I can only join uh, him 
And the question was asked in one of the earlier or the earlier session: Is it a win-win uh, deal? We in the EU obviously believe it is a win-win. Uh, it is a triumph of diplomacy. Um, diplomacy with its all tools. I mean, there are many tools of diplomacy. Sanctions are also a tool of diplomacy, and it is the combination of sanctions, but also dialogue, engagement, negotiations, and drafting in small group that has resulted in a rather uh, complicated deal. I mean, those of you who have attempted to go through the main text and its five annexes uh, understand what, what I have in mind. It is indeed um, a rather complicated arrangement uh, because the annexes cover nuclear issues, sanctions, uh, civil energy uh, cooperation, a uh, joint oversight commission and, and implementation. But, in essence, this is a simple uh, bargain. The bargain is that Iran will ensure the exclusively peaceful nature of its program uh, under international supervision, while in exchange there will be a gradual lifting of nuclear-related sanctions. Uh, the lifting of sanctions will occur only once the IAEA has verified that Iran has met its commitments, and this uh, will uh, initiate a so-called implementation day, which uh, we hope will actually happen very soon. The deal is not only based on trust. I mean, trust is important in negotiations, in uh, agreement. But there is a very robust uh, transparency mechanism centered around the IAEA with its uh, access based on uh, not only additional protocol but some uh, additional measures. So uh, we have confidence that uh, this is moving forward. Obviously, the eyes are on Iran now. Uh, and we are uh, looking uh, towards uh, the IAEA uh, confirming uh, its, uh, the implementation and also the resolution of the outstanding issues about Iran's past and present nuclear activities. Uh, an important element of this is the so-called possible military dimension of uh, the previous uh, Iranian uh, nuclear uh, program. Uh, the adoption day uh, has to occur 90 days after the endorsement of this deal by the UN Security Council, which has already happened in, a, in a resolution, and we are hoping it will happen any day. And the implementation day depends on how quickly Iran implements all the nuclear-related um, commitment. The EU uh, played a crucial role here, and uh, out of... Uh, I mean, I should probably allow others to, to compliment the EU and not highlight it. <laughs> but um, we believe that it uh, was a role of, uh, first of all, of uh, facilitator, uh, of, uh, but engagement of all um, other stakeholders was crucial. I mean, the, the whole negotiations or the whole file lasted for over 12, almost 12 years, I think. Uh, I actually sat on the board of governors of the IAEA when we reported Iran to the Security Council, and that was what, 11 years ago. Um, but we also were uh, the pen holder. I mean, it was the EU who was the pen holder of, of, of drafting this agreement. However, involvement of uh, the United States, involvement of Russia and China were crucial, and this is a good example of cooperation. Uh, there were some harsh words uh, about the current security environment uh, in the morning session, and I expect uh, that you know, we'll be discussing more about it both today and tomorrow. I myself might contribute to this discussion. But in spite of this, it is important to note that on such issues of global uh, nature as non-proliferation and disarmament, cooperation is possible, and we are trying to forge this and follow up on this cooperation with the Russian Federation, with China. Uh, and, you know, it's a tri triumph of multilateral diplomacy. It's imperfect. Everything is imperfect. Uh, it is... Uh, um, there are some question marks which, uh, which uh, Mark uh, highlighted, but we have confidence that this is better than the alternative, that the outcome, imperfect as it may be, 
uh, is, is, is very sound and is much better than the alternatives which were already mentioned, including uh, you know, military action. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so far. Very positive note. Uh, Wolfgang, will you continue on a positive note? Thank you, thank you uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I will certainly do, and I'm grateful uh, that um, I've been invited by more or less the originator of this conference uh, to speak on this panel. My, my first thanks uh, goes to um, Deputy Foreign Minister Kualek and, and the organizers for having invited me, and in particular um, for the, the, the extremely interesting night yesterday with the, the, the very impressive uh, film showing in what I have to say, a, a, a fantastic uh, historical setting in this uh, fantastic city of Prague, the Lucena Theater, which shows the, the whole breadth of culture and, uh, and, and, and architecture of this city. So I'm, I'm specifically grateful for that. Uh, I have to make a disclaimer. I will not uh, speak here formally on behalf of NATO, as on many of the issues which I intend to raise here, NATO has not formally expressed uh, herself. But what I would like you to, what I would like to provide you with, is a, a few personal thoughts on the issues we look uh, into more depth at, uh, at NATO and the WMD Center. Of the 45 countries currently planning to engage in civil nuclear energy programs or having embarked on them according to WNA World Nuclear Association figures, only a few may potentially raise proliferation concerns. And I would not like to go to the full list of those as uh, both Mark Fitzpatrick and, and Jacek Bilicja have gone into de the depths of some of them. Uh, and, and I essentially agree with most of their conclusions. So uh, in essence, I could stop here my presentation <laughs> and leave uh, more time for um, discussion. Uh, however, I, I would like to use a, a few minutes here to address a few positive and negative developments that we have observed in the past several years and are relevant to the assessment of the proliferation risk of new nuclear programs and the long-term survival of the NPT, and we just had the discussion on the, the NPT plan, panel. On the positive side, and I would not go into too much detail, there is obviously the, the Iranian nuclear program and the, uh, uh, after 12 years of diplomatic activity and, and negotiation, which I had the pleasure and burden to be partly involved in, um, th there is a real prospect for the international community to be assured, at least for the next 10 to 15 years, about the entire peace, entirely peaceful use of the, the Iranian nuclear program. It's not yet a done deal, but it seems to be on a, on a good track. What counts now is the full implementation by Iran and constant monitoring uh, of the agreement by the IEA, as we have just heard by Yacek, which would also allow Iran to embark uh, and, and to further enhance its civil nuclear, nuclear program. Uh, the recent ballistic missile launch uh, by Iran in violation of UNSCR uh, 1929, however, is not, uh, in my view, a very helpful uh, development in that respect. There are other programs. There are new programs in the Middle East by the United Arab Emirates under, under construction, which would be essentially the, the second commercially, um, the commercial uh, nuclear power plant in the, in the region. Um, which seems to follow an uh, end of Jordan, which has planned nuclear energy programs, which seem to follow the so-called gold standard, uh, which, uh, which means essentially that these countries renounce to national enrichment and, and repossessing. It is, however, questionable and, and too early to assess whether the gold standard that got actually empowered by the, uh, the, the Iran agreement, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. All negotiators and UNSCR Resolution uh, 2031 seem to confirm that the JCPOA does not constitute a precedent for, for others. There, there is the case of, of South Korea, and Mark Fitzpatrick mentioned it, uh, the question of whether uh, South Korea, which has been banned in, uh, uh, from enrichment uh, and, and reprocessing in the U.S. Uh, bilateral agreement since 1974, 
uh, whether the, the new agreement that was just agreed uh, um, in, in April 2015 leaves open the possibility for South Korea to embark in the future and through consultations with the US, if I read the text correctly, Adam, uh, in, in, in the future some kind of uh, national um, uh, reprocessing. There is, and Jacek already mentioned it, the assurance of, of supply mechanisms uh, which have been established, the IEA nuclear fuel bank in, in Kazakhstan and the Russian fuel bank in Angarsk, which will provide some additional assurance for countries engaging in nuclear energy without the need to build a full-fledged national fuel cycle. The numbers of uh, countries having ratified the additional protocol are growing constantly, also not at the pace envisaged, and uh, obviously key states are, are still missing, but Iran is, is a, a good positive example. The state-level concept that allows IEA to safeguard nuclear programs more efficiently is certainly also a, a positive development to be mentioned. There is also an increased reliance on what I call turnkey projects um, in, in civil nuclear energy, which means uh, build, own, operate uh, with a full supply and take back uh, for reprocessing of nuclear fuel, which is a, a um, um, business model that, that Russia is very uh, efficiently selling abroad, both in, in uh, two countries like, like Belarus, Vietnam, Bangladesh, and Jordan, who might uh, want to embark on, on civil nuclear energy. And obviously, this model reduces the incentive uh, for a fu uh, full-fledged national fuel cycle. There is the nuclear summit, security summit process that was mentioned, uh, and I have been involved in that one too for the, the last three summits. Um, and the removal of HEU from research reactors in many countries that contributed significantly to prevent the illicit acquisition of nuclear material by non-state actors. Uh, and finally, and, and uh, Mark already alluded to it, uh, the military nuclear programs in Iraq, Syria, and Libya were destroyed or dismantled in the past two decades. So far to the, the positive elements. I would now come to the more negative elements. The, the North Korean uh, program obviously still lacks a diplomatic solution, and the six-party talk process is stuck since years. DPRK obviously continues to work both on its nuclear but also on its ballistic missile program despite several UNSCR resolutions and sanctions and uh, so far no solution is in sight. There are serious doubts whether the Iran model can be um, uh, replicated in, in North Korea or whether we have to create a, another, another model. I think the lessons learned from the Iran nuclear deal is those negotiations can succeed if the, the key players invest their entire political capital, as was the case in, 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 in Iran. And which would mean that both China, US, but also other actors in the region will have to embark and, and, and really inject uh, their entire political capital. There, there have been and there continue to be uh, uh, speculation about intentions in, in Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and, and Egypt, which have, uh, we have heard already. Uh, most of these allegations, I would say, are at least questionable. But what is important is that all three countries still, in my view, fail to, assure the in to fully assure the international community on their intentions. It's, it's not deeds, it's intentions that, that count. Uh, civil and military nuclear, uh, nuclear programs in Pakistan and India are expanding and there are worrying signals of a continued arms race with regard to the overall numbers, sophistications, vectors and size, including the building up of uh, tactical arsenals as promoted by, by Pakistan. And the, the, another worrying trend or final worrying trend here is the growing um, expansion of ballistic missile programs and, and technology, which I think we, we have to keep a, a very uh, strong eye on it. And this brings me to a, a few other points that I think we have to look at if we regard uh, future proliferation risks. That's the whole element of, of new technologies and the, the, the expanding of, uh, of, of technology. There is the development of new smaller reactor types, uh, micro-reactors, floating reactors that we need to look at. 
There is the nuclear security risk associated with the increasing number of cyber attacks. There is the spread of intangible knowledge, both in the nuclear and in the ballistic missile field. New warhead technologies may lead to smaller warheads and smaller significant quantities, so they, they could question the, the, the value of the current safeguard system of the IAA. There is, an, as I said, an increasing spread in ballistic missile and, and um, cruise missile technologies uh, to many new actors, and I wouldn't exclude to non-state actors. And finally, I would, uh, in that regard, briefly address the terrorist risk related to WMD and, and nuclear and radiological material. And here I see a worrying trend in, in, in some regions, especially in Syria and Iraq, where ISIL obviously has access to uh, nuclear material and radioactive sources or is, is, is uh, trying to acquire it. And with all the the ideological background of, of this organization, their financial means, their access to territory. I think there is a real risk for the first time in, in, in many, many years that uh, WMD or radio radiological or, or chemical materials uh, could be essentially uh, used in, in terrorist attacks. So, positive and negative elements. Um, perhaps I have not been as positive as my predecessors, but in my summary, I think the, the overall summary is, is, is positive. Um, there are relatively few real nuclear newcomers, not the 25 or 35 forecasted by President Kennedy in, in the 1960s. The non-proliferation glass, in my view, is half full, half empty, but the positive developments prevail. There are still obviously outstanding cases that look for a resolution, like uh, the DPRK, Syria, and others. The NPT, in my view, still holds and is not serious, seriously uh, contested, uh, in particular also with regard to the elements of, of, of peaceful uses. I think there is a growing um, uh, element in the NPT process that people are, are looking towards peaceful nuclear programs rather than military nuclear programs. There are new trends, new technologies, and new actors that certainly don't make our joint life here easier. But overall, a lot to look at and monitor, but um, no real negative trend um, in the past few years, I would say. Thank you. Thank you all for being very succinct to the point and, uh, 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 and also for uh, um, uh, being quite positive on, uh, on some elements. Uh, uh, the mood is, uh, uh, is not corresponding to that, uh, uh, to that mood that you, 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 you try to spread. Uh, before we uh, turn to uh, 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 a debate. Uh, the open, I will open the floor. We have uh, uh, quite uh, some time to uh, to debate. Uh, we have half an hour for uh, for a debate. Uh, I'll try to uh, uh, make uh, a kind of uh, 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 clusters of uh, questions uh, for debate, but I leave it free for you to address uh, even things which haven't been mentioned. So I try to, uh, 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 um, uh, to summarize a little bit. Uh, one cluster is uh, uh, there are countries with which you can make a bargain. This is Iran. Uh, it is clearly said that any attempt to make a bargain with North Korea failed. So. Uh, the question is, what are the conditions uh, uh, to make a bargain on North Korea possible? Uh, this is, to me, one of the, uh, one of the key questions. The second question is, um, uh, with all the successes, it doesn't uh, seem that uh, uh, the rest of the world, <laughs> I would call it, uh, is following uh, uh, the uh, trend of the West, uh, which is both United States and, and uh, Europe, uh, attaches much less salience to nuclear uh, 
uh, weapons uh, in their uh, strategies than the rest of the world. Uh, it's definitely not the case of Russia, uh, where you can hear uh, the nuclear gets more salience uh, in Russian uh, uh, strategy. Uh, no matter how Russia is important uh, a partner uh, in engagement uh, for uh, addressing the issues like Iran, and North Korea and, uh, and others, we see that uh, the price of having Russia engaged in this is that uh, uh, Russia uh, uh, gives more salience to, uh, uh, to nukes uh, than uh, we have been witnessing in 90s. Uh, let's say, uh, or in previous decade. Uh, now, uh, another uh, issue is um, that all the regimes uh, are based on uh, actually state uh, actors. And uh, it's been always a problem of uh, uh, contested non-recognized territories which uh, have been not subdued to veri verification and control, uh, which served as a loopholes of, uh, of a system uh, for uh, proliferation. Uh, so how to address uh, this issue? Uh, definitely these are all quasi-states. Uh, you mentioned Daesh, ISIS. Uh, it's a non-state actor with the attributes of the state. <laughs> uh, and if you control a territory, then uh, uh, you should be somewhat, uh, uh, there should be a question how you can uh, put certain territories uh, which are not part of the uh, 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 recognized international system uh, or are not recognized at least by some uh, parts of international system under uh, uh, control. Uh, and then there is a whole uh, uh, question of uh, technology, which uh, is related to uh, the previous uh, two questions. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm grateful to Wolfgang, he, uh, who raised it. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, technological advancement in conventional weapons is actually uh, uh, causing uh, a problem in traditional uh, distinction between conventional and non-conventional weapons because you have, uh, uh, for example, some conventional weapons, precision guided uh, uh, missiles, long range missiles, which are basically uh, uh, in the strategy and in deterrence uh, uh, play uh, uh, a role which is commensurate to uh, the previous role of some uh, 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 non-conventional weapons. Miniaturization of uh, uh, platforms, uh, conventional and non-conventional platforms, is missiles. Uh, reactors. It's, uh, it's a problem. This is a serious problem which uh, decreases the threshold uh, for uh, uh, it's not just the prerogative of the state uh, which can afford to acquire some of these technologies. These technologies are basically uh, uh, available to uh, private actors, call it like that. Uh, and so these are the clusters uh, as I see them uh, uh, emerging. And uh, I don't want these clusters to be a cloud which will overshadow uh, the uh, some positive notes you've mentioned and, and, uh, and the positive trends. Uh, but we have to face them uh, uh, if we would like to maintain uh, a, a credible uh, system, uh, uh, non-proliferation system at work. Uh, so these were my comments on uh, you. If you would like to uh, 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 use this opportunity to, uh, to make a comment on, especially uh, Mark and Jacek, on uh, what has been said uh, recently, but also Wolfgang, and then we open the floor. Uh, so please indicate if you would like to uh, uh, make a question, uh, and I will call up Jacek. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I mean, the, the big issue which you raised very rightly is that 
for, for a number of decades, uh, the non-proliferation uh, system and, uh, I mean, basically all, you know, treaty-based instruments were centered on, um, on states. And, you know, NPT, uh, it's, and, and we have now to deal with uh, countries which are also failed states, which do not control their uh, territory. We have the emergence of terrorist organizations uh, like, like ISIL, some of it calling itself like ISIL, the state, and so on. So we, we need to adopt the instruments. But I think this adaptation has actually started. It has begun a while ago. I mean, even uh, UN Security Council Resolution 1540 with a requirement to penalize proliferation uh, by states, it is to penalize proliferation by individuals and organizations. So already this, back in 2004, was a focus. Proliferation Security Initiative with its focus on interdiction. I would claim that the entire nuclear security summit process is also really driven by this, uh, by this threat and is, 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 is lowering this threat. So this adaptation which you mentioned, which is absolutely necessary of the international tools has, has started. Maybe it's not sufficient, but you know, so far it, it, it has mostly worked. And, and on the issue of North Korea, yes, I think it is, it is a very difficult case. Uh, I just, a couple of days ago, I read the North Korean statement in the first committee in, in New York on nuclear issues, and it is very clear that they consider themselves uh, a, a country which applies nuclear deterrence to sort of regime survival. This is what uh, is clearly at the back of, of their mind, which makes it much more difficult, uh, obviously, to bargain. But, again, negotiations uh, and six-party talks and the objective of um, nuclear or denuclearized Korean Peninsula is something which we should probably have as an, as an objective. Thank you. Let me address the first two um, clusters that you, you, you mentioned. What are the conditions to make a bargain uh, with North Korea? Uh, North Korea sees nuclear weapons as essential to protecting uh, the family, the Kim family, which means the regime, which means North Korea. As long as they believe that the nuclear weapons are essential for protecting them, they're not going to give them up. Now, looking at it from the outside, it seems very clear that nuclear weapons cannot save the regime from collapse. That what threatens the regime will be internal disagreement by its people, by seniors who fear being the next person to be purged. And North Korea cannot make the economic advances it seeks as long as it has this nuclear weapons program because they will remain sanctioned. So, logically, they should be willing to make a deal, but they won't, because they really just see them as essential. So, as I said, I think eventually the only solution is unification. Now, that will be a very messy process, because North Korean collapse will create non-state actors. And now I get to the second point. Non-state actors in a country where there are nuclear weapons uh, it will be very, very dangerous. Last night, after the movie, uh, director Peter uh, Antony talked about ISIS potentially getting nuclear weapons or radiological weapons. He used the two almost interchangeably. Wolfgang and I were talking afterwards, and you know, he should realize that it's not easy at all for ISIS to get nuclear weapons, but getting radiological dirty bombs is very possible. Uh, the nuclear smuggling is incidents that have um, occurred to date have almost all been from the point of supply driven. People uh, from the former Soviet Union acquire some uranium or they pretend to acquire and they try to sell it. There's no buyer all the buyers have been police officers pretending to be ISIS. 
uh, these sting operations. Uh, that's good. There's, no de there's nobody buying it. But I worry that where there is a supply and where there are sting operations, it could create a demand. ISIS could begin to try to buy some. That would be very dangerous indeed. But even more dangerous would be North Korean warlords acquiring uh, nuclear weapons. Thank you. Uh, I'll comment in this moment. Okay, so lady in green, then lady in blue, Thank and you. then a gentleman over there. Thank you. A comment on North Korea and Iran, and, and, and then a question to Jacek Pulis. Please identify yourself. Uh, My name is Tarja Kronberg. I'm co-president of the PN. And Just for the record. <laughs> yes, simply. But I, I would like to comment on having studied the Iran case very closely. It's very difficult to compare Iran and North Korea. The Iran deal was a result of political will with the two presidents. Iran has never said it wanted nuclear weapons, and it even had a religious fatwa on nuclear weapons, whether we believe it or not, this was at least the scene. In North Korea, it's in the constitution. Everybody says they need nuclear weapons, and, and uh, no leader has the political will to, to do anything. So, so in a way, I agree with Mark that, that uh, some kind of unification is, or regime change in one form or the other is, is the necessary precondition. But I would like to ask you, to specify, could you be more specific on the military option that actually was on the U.S. table and why, why did they remove it? Then a question to Jacek Pulitza. The, actually, the Iran case reveals a kind of drift in the NPT foundation. It's sort of a transatlantic drift because the EU actually supports the production and, and um, and the fuel cycle and so forth, and actually the right, in quotation, the right to enrich. On the other hand, in the discussions in Iran case, the Americans never approved of the right to enrich because it's not in the NPT. So there's a difference of opinion. While everybody may agree that Iran is not the precedent for, for enrichment, how will the NPT deal in the future with these two different interpretations? of enrichment within the regime. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Ferruki. Thank you. Uh, building up on the Iranian deal, and Mark said very rightly that in the future we will see more verification activities regarding, at least on the implementation of the agreement itself, which is, I think, very good for everybody in the region. But do you think that this verification activity in the region, which is needed, uh, will apply also to the ambiguous policy of Israel regarding their nuclear uh, program? Mm. And it will ease, in my view, if so, the peaceful cooperation within the region since Iran has a good basis for enrichment under the international control, of course. Thank you. Oh, the gentleman over there. Uh, Matthew Kranig at Georgetown University. Uh, very interesting panel. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a comment and then a question. Uh, first, a comment. Um, lest there be uh, any confusion that there's uh, kind of uh, unanimous support for, for the Iran deal, I just wanted to point out that, that I do think that this is a weak deal that won't achieve its intended goal of, of stopping Iran from building nuclear weapons. Uh, in part because um, we lift our, our sanctions leverage too early, uh, which I think gives Iran incentives to cheat. And second, because of the sunset provisions, uh, that uh, all these limits are lifted over time, and so all Iran has to do is, is be patient, wait for these limits to expire, and, and build nuclear weapons. And I do think that there was a better alternative, uh, namely sticking with the pressure track and holding out for a deal that would have solved the problem, uh, that would have gotten Iran to, to give up its enrichment program altogether. But we could probably debate that all afternoon. So my question is about North Korea. And I agree very much with Mark that uh, the only way to solve the problem will be to, to unify, uh, ideally peacefully unify, and denuclearize the peninsula. Uh, the question, of course, is how to get there. And I was in Seoul, South Korea this summer uh, talking to colleagues there. And, and they said, you, the United States, and the international community never did for North Korea what you did for Iran. Uh, why not make North Korea 
kind of a foremost priority uh, of the White House and of international diplomacy for as long as it takes. You know, we, we spent a decade on, on Iran. Uh, why not bring uh, true diplomatic and economic pressure to bear? You know, we put in place probably the toughest international sanctions regime ever against Iran. Uh, we do have pressure against North Korea, but it's, it's not, um, not anywhere close. So I guess the question for the panel is, do you think something like that is, is feasible? Uh, uh, is that a feasible approach, both in terms of getting international support to bring that kind of pressure to bear? And then second, do you think it would be effective in um, convincing North Korea either to give up the program or in uh, to forcing a, a regime collapse? So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, please. I mean, both of you. Okay. 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 okay One after another. Uh, my name uh, is Muna Mahamre. I'm a Jordanian lawyer and PNND coordinator for Arab countries. Um, back in 2009, an uh, Israeli leg legislator, his name is Isaac bin Israel, declared that his country had a year or so to attack Iranian nuclear sites. Due to this statement, how can we focus attention on Israelis and nuclear capabilities and urge it to open its nuclear facilities to the UN inspect, uh, inspections? I, I just would like to know, yeah. Would you like? It seems we think on the same web link. <laughs> 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 Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I want also to reiterate on the IAEA uh, resolution which she passed criticizing the Israelis. She said, Israel refuses the, to sign the NPT. Also, Israel uh, failed to disclose all of its nuclear facilities on which uh, IAEA expressed her concern about the stability in the area due to these nuclear weapons. I thank you. I am Salwa Masri, uh, Jordan, parliamentarian, and uh, MB, uh, what is it? PNND uh, council member. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so let's collect uh, two more questions and then they will respond, please. Yeah. Yes, yes, I see you. I see you. You'll be the last question. <laughs> I'm Manishankar Raya, a member of Parliament India. Why is it that the four main speakers all missed out the word Israel? None of them addressed it. And does Mr. Fitzpatrick find a strange difference in the U.S. approach to uh, a non-declared, uh, to a and to a nuclear power like North Korea and a, no, and a nuclear power like Israel. Thank you. Uh, the last question. Abul Kalam Azad, member of parliament from Bangladesh. I'm neither a scientist nor an economist. I have a general question, which I raised yesterday also. Most of the countries, whether it is USA, Russia, China, Japan, European Union, Bangladesh, they take the decision keeping in mind either a political consideration or an economic condition. Is PNND, do you have any cell where you have a research that which country is taking decision? whether on political consideration to dominate or economic consideration, because these are the two main subjects which all countries being run, either on political consideration or on economic consideration. Now, do you have any system, whether it is Barack Obama or Russian president or prime minister of Bangladesh, because they consider whether if it is going to help me economically or it is going to help me politically to give me a gain in power. Do you have any cell like that? This is my question. Thank you. Uh, okay, well, uh, okay, 
very brief, I, I, I see three hands, but I, I allow very brief uh, three intervention. One more than, uh, uh, than Mr. Tuma and then uh, uh, Tariq, yeah? Bainuddin um, Khan Badal, parliamentarian from Bangladesh. My question is very straight. That is unification of uh, uh, Korea. Uh, the speaker is telling that is the solution. But how come the speaker is so confident if it is unified? Who is dominating whom? The peninsula can be dominated by the North Koreans also. So how come he can be so sure once it is united, it will uh, forgo its arms and everything? That's my question. Thank you. Very clear. Uh, Mr. Tuma. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Tuma. <clears throat> I am an associate researcher of the Institute of International Relations here in Prague. I would like to share uh, the positive evaluation of all speakers as regards uh, Iranian nuclear deal. But I would like to put it in the link with the building up of the anti-ballistic missile uh, system in the, in the Europe because from the very beginning during the President W. Bush era, uh, there was defended this building up of the situation in the uh, with regards to um, so-called rock states and mainly Iranian. Now we have Iranian nuclear deal done. My question is going to uh, Director Fitzpatrick. What's your assessment as regards some kind of modification of the building up of, the, of this system? Thank you. Okay, clear question. Uh, missile defense. Uh, What's the implication of the Iranian deal of the future of the missile defense in Europe? Yes, Tarek, last question. Thank you, Tarek Rav from Cypri. Uh, I had a question regarding uh, North Korea, DPRK. Um, the agreed framework in 1994 showed that it was possible to reach an agreed uh, outcome with uh, North Korea. From the North Korean perspective, the deal uh, started going south when President Clinton lost control of Congress and Newt Gingrich and others took over control of Congress and one of the first actions was to cut out the funds for paying for the 500,000 tons of heavy oil that was going to go to North Korea in return for the closure of the reactor. So from the North Korean perspective, as in, uh, it was the break came from the, from the Western side and then for a variety of other reasons, uh, the agreed framework collapsed but it still showed that it was possible to reach an agreement. Uh, and Ambassador Bob Gallucci, who negotiated the Great Framework, uh, was quoted as saying that he thought that North Korea would collapse before the Great Framework could be fully implemented. That means in terms of the two light water reactors being built. So my comment to my friend Mark is, he again mentioned collapse of North Korea. People have been waiting for the collapse of North Korea for decades. For one reason or another, it hasn't collapsed. So wouldn't it be better if there was some sort of an initiative where some part of the sanctions pressure is uh, relieved and perhaps the EU, uh, hard on the heels of its success on the Iran deal, could be a, a new actor and provide some sanctions relief on the humanitarian side and work towards a solution. One could be a multilateral approach to the nuclear fuel cycle and update the 1992 um, South-North Agreement under which each country agreed not to develop enrichment and reprocessing and multilateralize the enrichment and the reprocessing facilities in uh, North Korea for civilian purposes. Uh, so that's in a sense, initiative for the EU. Mm -hmm. And a comment on the Iran deal, I, th I think one should also remember that despite the pressure of sanctions, Iran had 19,000 centrifuges, of which 10,000 were enriching. It had produced over nearly 200 kilograms of 20% enriched uranium and nearly 2,000 of 5%. So well, I think once we shouldn't fool ourselves that it was just the success of sanctions. And as Secretary Kerry quite correctly pointed out, 
that there was also pressure from the Iranian side. So I think this was a meeting of minds for, for good reasons, and I think this is the best deal that could have been achieved, and many people were quite surprised that Iran agreed to the concessions that it agreed to under this deal. Thank you. Yeah, well, I think it's no doubt uh, that uh, the, the deal with Iran was the best deal which could have been achieved. The question is, uh, is, it, is it good enough? Uh, no, it's, we have uh, uh, actually, uh, the elephant in the room uh, was Israel, so, so it was uh, several uh, speakers called uh, uh, for comments on, uh, on Israel. Uh, in my view, Israel is not an emerging uh, uh, power, it's uh, emerged. Uh, uh, power uh, already, uh, but uh, uh, the, the comments uh, on, from speakers were required. Uh, then there was a, a, a lot of questions about Korea, so uh, especially those who mentioned North Korea, I would like to ask you to comment on that uh, 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 question. Uh, as well, and of course there were uh, different uh, uh, perspectives on uh, Iranian uh, deal and its, uh, and its consequences uh, uh, for the region, but also for uh, globally. Uh, let us start with Wolfgang uh, and we'll go in a reverse order uh, of the speakers. Thank you very much, Kiri. I, I won't address all of, all of them. Uh, I, I would just uh, first touch uh, uh, again quickly on the question of, of non-state actors and, and new technologies. And, and I, I agree with Jacek, we have an, a number of instruments that are there to, to control, and, and Mark mentioned the, nu the nuclear uh, black market of radioactive sources and all the controls established with the IEA nuclear security uh, uh, fund. The, the, the real problem I see is there, that there, there are technologies nowadays which we couldn't imagine five, ten years ago, that allow even small quantities of radioactive or chemical material to be used as a WMD. You can buy the, the, the drones that your kids use and, and are directed with an iPhone in large quantities. There is a Chinese company that is producing, I think, 30,000 uh, each year of these small uh, uh, drones and you you can and and we have seen them employed at the pr prime minister of japan's office with a, a, a showcase of how, how you can employ these uh, these small drones so there is a risk that we haven't uh, been uh, addressing enough. Uh, it's taken up in the export control regimes now, and I think there is an, an urgent need to take it, it up. But sometimes, and, and we see that with communication technology, the, the de technological developments are much faster than our ability as governments and international institutions to react to them. The, the second uh, point I wanted to touch upon is, is DPRK, and, and I think uh, I, I agree uh, more or less with Matthew, also I don't agree with his position on the Iranian nuclear deal, that, uh, and I mentioned that in my intervention, it's really a question of investing political capital. And if, if I had with me one of my, my PowerPoint presentations, I have a uh, a picture still dating back to 2005 and the, the uh, uh, George uh, W. Bush uh, administration where he was his portrayed talking to the Iranians on the phone and his secretary desperately tries to connect him to a, a, a jumping up North Korean leader wanting to talk to George W. Bush and that's essentially the, 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 the point. The, there has been a lot of capital invested in the Iranian nuclear deal, and that's why it succeeded. I've never seen since uh, probably decades an American foreign minister spending uh, entire four weeks in a place to negotiate one single single deal. I think that's really an, an something important. And, and I think if, if there is a little bit more of... of um, uh, political capital invested, and not only in the U.S. I think uh, China has a, an important role to play here if they want to be a responsible player in, in, in Asia to, to really make a, a deal happen. And the last uh, 
point, and I'm coming back to, to uh, new technologies, is the question on, on ballistic missile uh, defense. Uh, again, uh, technological developments are so fast that whatever we do c now, we need to plan for the 10, 15 years uh, of technological developments ahead, and that is why uh, I, I understand that there, there, are cons there, there are questions raised about uh, Iran and, and uh, ballistic missile defense, but we have to, to look at future developments, other players, other uh, actors, and it's, this system as is established currently is not a single purpose system. Thank you. Thank you, it was clear answer to that question. Jacek. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, sanctions against Iran, uh, or I mean the, the, the politically correct world in the EU is restrictive measures. Uh, they were not only meant to, uh, to uh, slow down or prevent uh, the growth of Iranian enrichment capabilities. The sanctions were much broader. And it is the economic sanctions which, which worked also. Because, and this is another example of a difference between Iran and North Korea, in Iran we do have uh, uh, some, at least some elements of a, of a pluralistic political system. There is public opinion. There are expectations articulated by the population that do not want to keep Iran a pariah state under sanctions. This is very different uh, you know, from North Korea who you know, couldn't care less about the international opinion probably. So the sanctions worked because they were, they were uh, you know, broader. It was not only about limiting the number of, of centrifuges, but, but it was also about the economic sanctions. And now I'm moving to the question about the deal itself. Um, they, uh, the lifting of sanctions is very much uh, linked to the, uh, to the implementation uh, by Iran of the deal and there is a, a unique snapback mechanism which uh, does not require um, or does not allow to use a veto, for example, by, by P5. I mean, this is the creativity of diplomacy that uh, there is an, a, a different mechanism now, a snapback mechanism for putting sanctions uh, again uh, in, into force in case uh, Iran doesn't uh, comply. Uh, I think EU and US worked very well hand in hand in the negotiations and also will work in the implementation. Obviously, there are some differences of perspectives for historical reasons. Uh, let's say, um, I mean, for the European countries all have and have maintained diplomatic relations with the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, we have ambassadors, we have bilateral visits, uh, certain commercial relationships, which and, and the U.S. have a very different sort of emotional background and the history. But on this particular, uh, in this particular issue, the cooperation was, was excellent and very much hand in hand. The question about uh, enrichment. The NPT uh, and the NPT restrictions and also the IAEA safeguards are not based on limiting enrichment. And, and we have to face it. They are based on, um, in case of the IAEA safeguards, on accountancy and control of nuclear material in use. This is not, uh, so, so there is no legal ground uh, in the NPT uh, to, to discuss uh, what, what you mentioned. However, uh, what I mentioned in my initial remarks is that in many cases it really doesn't make sense for countries to, to invest in enrichment. And this was one of the arguments uh, about, uh, about the Iranian uh, nuclear program. It's simply economically not viable to invest. Uh, that's why having an alternative which is, you know, international market, provision of fuel by an outside, um, uh, uh, an outside uh, country like uh, Russians do in case of Boucher, under strict IAEA safeguards and then taking the fuel back, uh, having the nuclear fuel bank, so multilateral um, uh, options, 
I mean, those are all options which, which are on the table and are being exercised. So I think this uh, sort of slightly res resolves uh, the, the problem you mentioned. I counted four questions on Israel, four on North Korea, two on Iran. Let me go in reverse order. Um, if this body, our Prague agenda, operated under the principle of consensus, uh, Matthew Kronig uh, uh, broke the consensus with regard to applause for the Iran deal. Um, and as he noted, we could debate uh, the merits and demerits all, after, all day, tomorrow and the next day. Um, but just on one point, on the sunshine provision, uh, I understand the argument, and I said it myself, after 15 years, the limits come off. That's a concern. But one cannot say that there should not have been any sunshine provision at all. If one says that Iran must have adopted limits forever, then there would not have been a deal. No country, no sovereign country would negotiate a deal binding its hands forever. One could only argue about whether 15 years should have been 25 years. And, you know, compromises were made and the best deal was struck, whether it was the best deal we could debate. One of the demerits, uh, additional demerits of the deal that wasn't mentioned was that it didn't deal with missiles. And this gets to the, the question raised by the gentleman in the back. What are the implications of the Iran deal for the European uh, missile defense system. If Iran um, will not be able to develop nuclear weapons, it obviously should have implications for a system that was based on defending uh, Europe and uh, other countries against uh, an Iranian um, nuclear armed uh, missile. So I think that if this deal is faithfully implemented over 15 years, the phased adoptive approach will be adopted to take that into account. Whether it will be scrapped entirely, I doubt. I doubt it because Iran is continuing to develop its missiles. Its recent test was noted. And there will remain uncertainties about whether Iran will continue to implement the deal. But I think we should look for and press for um, some change um, in um, the missile defense system. With regard to North Korea, Tarya, you asked a, a factual question. What were the military options that were readied against uh, North Korea? I was um, in the seventh floor of the State Department. I'm a former U.S. diplomat. At the time, I remember the discussions about a military option. I'm not allowed to talk about them, but I do know that they were reported in a book uh, by Robert Gallucci and uh, two others, and they mentioned that the Pentagon was readying um, military options to attack uh, North Korean um, weapons or nuclear facilities. Uh, that's what, I mean, of course the Pentagon would ready such options. They're supposed to. But then it was realized that uh, this could lead to uh, a resumption of the Korean War, and uh, the option was tabled was put aside. But it was interesting that a few years later, two very distinguished, uh, respected American scholars um, suggested in 1998 that the United States should preemptively strike a North Korean ballistic missile facility if it looked like they were getting ready to, to launch. Preemptive strikes. These two gentlemen were named William Perry and Ash Carter. Ash Carter is today the U.S. Defense Secretary. William Perry was former Defense Secretary. Both of them said when they were Defense Secretaries they wouldn't do that. But these kind of ideas percolate. Um, yes, um, uh, Matthew, I agree that, um, that the United States has given less priority to North Korea than, than is warranted. But it's interesting that one hears that in Seoul, as you said, and the South Koreans themselves don't give it that high a priority. And they keep changing their policies every couple of elections. So I think uh, South Korea should take the lead on this and use their new leverage with China to try to persuade China to take the measures that would be necessary. You know, South Korea's now, their best friend is in Beijing. Use that would be my, my suggestion. And then, um, 
Tariq had the very exact opposite. You want to put more pressure, he wants to relieve the pressure. Um, and he came up with a novel idea of multilateralizing North Korea's enrichment uh, you know, facility. It, it's, a, it's sort of an interesting idea. I, I like the idea of, of both South and North um, sharing some technology, but I think this technology I would rather North got rid of altogether because, look, it's not for civilian purposes. It's for military purposes. And let's not pretend otherwise. Uh, somebody asked the point, um, unification, well, it could be North uh, uh, dominating over the South. Well, that's not just, that's not going to happen. That is not going to happen. It's going to be the South, uh, let's not use the word dominating, but it's, it's going to be a South-led unification. Um, it just cannot be otherwise. I did not, okay, let's, it, any other North Korea? Yeah, um, oh, yeah, sorry, um, Israel. I did not use the word Israel in my presentation for the reasons the chairman said, because this was supposed to be about emerging uh, nuclear power. So I didn't use the words India or Pakistan either. Uh, they're all in the same category. Um, but I did imply in my opening sentence, there are nine too many nuclear armed states. And that includes, of course, Israel, India, and Pakistan. And they all, all states ought to give up and find ways to move toward giving up nuclear weapons. Now, the verification measures under the um, Iran deal could certainly um, help uh, in a future um, system whereby Israel um, agreed to give up its nuclear option. That day, um, Israel has not said never. Israel hasn't put it in its constitution. Israel says that when they're at peace, when their borders are secure, they would be ready to join the NPT. So, Let's work toward that day. It requires working both toward the peace and the disarmament, it's probably simultaneously. And this is why the Helsinki conference did not emerge, is because Israel wanted security to be on the agenda, and that agenda could not be finalized in time. So it wasn't just Israel's fault that there wasn't a Helsinki conference. Yes, we should continue to press Israel to um, accept the NPT. Yes, I, I think there's, there's, there's not enough. Um, well, here I am. I didn't even mention it myself, so I can't say there's not enough pressure on Israel. I, I don't want to say there should be pressure on Israel, but there should be a recognition of the reality of what would be required and not just empty words of, of using the Israel uh, issue for propaganda purposes. Have I been provocative enough? I'll stop. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we, uh, we addressed all the uh, questions which have been raised. If not sufficiently, there is an opportunity and there is a fantastic opportunity to address these questions over delicious lunch, which has been prepared uh, around the corner. And it's just this lunch which will uh, divide this uh, morning uh, conference uh, with the afternoon uh, PNND conference, which will continue uh, and will start two o'clock in this very room. Uh, let me uh, ask you to, to join me in thanking uh, the speakers and uh, also applauding uh, uh, you to uh, be very attentive uh, audience and uh, having a very good comments and questions. So, thank you very much.